Well, good evening, everyone. It's good to see everybody back this evening. Um, I hope everybody's had a wonderful afternoon and enjoyed their nice and hopefully relaxing Sunday. Um, but uh, before we go any farther, we always like to open up in prayer. Is there any uh, prayer requests, prayer needs, or praise reports that might be on someone's heart, mind, soul this evening? Mr. Styles, Carpenter, what was the last one's name? Bailey. Bailey. Many people have lost a lot of loved ones and a lot of people are sick right now. People definitely need a lot of love. A lot of love and encouragement right now. Anything? She is going to have one. Yeah, that's what somebody said her sister come back. Oh, amen. I know that has to be painful. There's no way that just... They just... And, there's no way. I mean, that's just got to be absolutely horrific. I can only imagine how bad that's going to be. Let's be with her. Goodness gracious. I'll have a praise report. the Lord. We have many objects of prayer tonight for sure. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and just put these things at His feet. Father, tonight, Lord God, we come together around Your Word and around song to worship You. Father, we have so many objects of prayer and a wonderful object of praise tonight, Lord God, and we, we want to take all those objects that are burdening our hearts, Lord God, those those people that are sick and have lost loved ones and those that are about to undergo vast medical procedures, God, if you would just, just work in those situations, Lord God. Those that have lost loved ones, let them know your comfort. Comfort them with your loving arms. Those that are about to go through these in-depth processes, God, thank you for blessing them with the, with the ability to go through with those medical procedures. God, be with, be with the, uh, the surgeons, be with the people, be with the family, be with uh, both the sister and the patient, God. Be with Miss Carnes in this moment, and Lord, and just let them know that you're God and to just fill up the room and the space around them. And God, be with all those people who <clears throat> have just, they're, they're, they're so hurt right now for the loss of loved ones. And those who have loved ones that are sick and in the hospital, God, and just be with those folks. And Father, thank you for just such a wonderful report of someone who trusts you. And even in the case of a lost uh, friend and how they've, 
They, they have found their place in this world and they, and they trust you and they want to serve you. God, thank you for those reports. And God, just be with us tonight and let this time be enriching. Let it be intentional. Let us go into your word for the purpose of sanctification. Let us sing songs to you for the, for the purpose of glory and that we would sing to you and worship you. And God, we praise you and love you. And it's in Christ's precious name. Amen. Grace, would you like to come sing? Thank you. Hmm? What? We'll start with page 522. Page 522, when the morning comes.
Praise the Lord. Thank you, Grace, for leading us to the throne. Thank you for such wonderful songs and directing us. And I appreciate you so much for that. If you have a copy of your Bible, I encourage you to turn with me to 1 John. 1 John, the epistle of 1 John. We are continuing our study of Jesus is the life. Jesus is the life. We're going to jump straight in tonight, and we're going to be in chapter 2, beginning in verse number 3. 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 3. And tonight, as we read, I want us all to concentrate and think about this subject, the headship of our life. The headship of our life. 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse number 3. The Bible tells us, Now by this we know that we know Him, if we keep His commandments. He who says, I know Him, and does not keep His commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in Him. But whoever keeps His word, truly the love of God is perfected in Him. By this we know that we are in Him. Verse number 6, He who says He abides in Him ought Himself also to walk just as He walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment, which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Verse number 8, again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness, and does not know where he is going, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Allow it to open our hearts and speak directly into our hearts, our minds, and our soul. Tonight, Lord God, direct us and open us, and it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Tonight we are looking at the idea and subject of the headship of our life. 1 John uh, chapter 2, we see that the Apostle John, John the Beloved, goes into this text in the idea and going into the place of saying, Listen, my friend, God is the head of your life. He is truly, in Christ Jesus, the King, the Lord of your life. Now, when I was at Fruitland, of course, you know, those Fruitland boys, they all believe they already know it all. They do. They do. They all come out, even some of the professors, as some of you may know. They think they know it all. They come out and they say, I've got everything figured out, and yet they debate things like it's going out of style. They all do. They go back and forth over things, and they want to debate this and debate that. And one of the main ones that is under scrutiny today, we will say, is the debate between lordship salvation and free grace theology. And someone says, well, what in the world does that mean? It don't mean much of nothing. One of them is free grace, which means you can live life however you please. The grace of God's free, no repentance, no anything. You just do what you want to do. God's sufficient to save you and all this other stuff. Well, my friends, that's not true. The other is called lordship salvation. Jesus becomes lord of your life. And in your life, you are then bound to the Spirit of God, by the Spirit of God. Bound to Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I believe if you can't understand by that, I am a fan of lordship salvation, if it didn't come across clear enough. But you see in the text here, John goes into the place and he says, As Lord, as Savior, and as the head of your life, Verse number 3 says, first of all, as a saved Christian, as a sinner saved by the sweet grace of God, you are under His commands. The Bible says, now by this we know that we know Him, the assurance of our salvation. By this we know that we know Him. We know. If you look down in verse number 5 at the end of it, it says, by this we know that we are in Him. I tell you what, my friends, there is nothing in this life greater and more wonderful than this to understand the fact and know that Jesus Christ is your Savior. To know that He is. 
And the Bible tells us here, it says, by this we know. You can fully trust in the assurance of your salvation when it is in Christ Jesus and Him alone. You know. But I love how the Apostle John goes and he says something here that's very important. He says, by this we know. But also he says, by this we know. It is very encouraging for the Apostle John to step forward and say, listen, my friends, we can look out that way and we can look out that way and we can debate all these insane doctrines that go back and forth. But at the end of the day, blessed, because now by this we know. We know that in Him we have assurance of salvation but also in the assurance of our salvation and being under His commands, this is where it takes place. How are we assured of our salvation? Verse number 3, if we keep His commands. If we keep His commandments. You see, there is one little word there that I have become absolutely infatuated with. Keep. Keep. If you go back into Genesis chapter 2, The man was made in day number six. And then God placed him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. You see the word keep so often is put into the idea of a legalistic practice. Oh, you've got to keep every bit of it. You've got to be so in tune with it. You've got to keep it in the fashion of being a legalist. When rather what the Word of God teaches is that if we keep in the sense of of guarding it, holding close, holding dear, following not out of legalism but out of love, following not out of a practice but out of a joyous life for Christ. Keep with all you have. Genesis chapter 2 says the man was put in to keep the Word of God. Guard it closely. And there's a wonderful illustration A young pastor went to a much more seasoned pastor in life. The young pastor's name is H.B. Charles. H.B. went to another pastor, a much more seasoned pastor in life, and said he went to a new church. He was the pastor of his lifelong church for many years. And his father passed away. He stepped in the position of pastor and then was called to go to Jacksonville, Florida. And in Jacksonville, Florida, he reached out to a seasoned pastor and said, You know, I was always kind of known at the, my home church, but I, I need advice. What do I do? I don't know what to do. And the man said, I want to tell you a story. Long ago in the Wild West, there were bank robbers that came into town. And these bank robbers just constantly went around robbing banks. But they came to this one town that was so heavily fortified at the bank They couldn't get in. They tried coming underneath, from the top, from the sides, everything they could. Well, these bank robbers come up with a a plan. They schemed. They went out to the edge of the city and began to catch houses on fire. Well, everybody from inside the city said, Oh, goodness, we've got to go. So they ran, ran, ran to outside to the city gates and began putting out all these fires around it. And the old pastor said to the young man, he said, My friend, never... Leave the guard of the bank. Keep the bank safe. So often we go back and forth on debating so many different things and all these things in the world, but the number one thing we must always come back to, standing on the Word of God and keeping His commandments. Keeping the Word safe. Keep the treasure safe. Guard your doctrine. Guard the Word of God. Guard the church. And husbands, guard your wife. Guard your home. Keep it. But it says here, the authority in our salvation is that it is this. It is not how we act. It is the fact of if we keep His commandments, the commandments of God, the commandments of Christ Jesus, Now, so often you hear that it's just the moral commands. Be sweet, be loving. I have so often heard there is a new 11th commandment. Thou shalt be nice. 
That's so untrue. You don't add to. But it says here, if we keep His commandments, Christ Jesus our Lord. What did Jesus command? He commanded a lot. He went through a lot. You see, if we keep His commandments, the first thing He said, they said, what is the law? And He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love is the command of Christ. Love. And I have a wonderful book here by a man named Oswald Chambers. I've been reading it lately, and I'm telling you what, he was uh, one to the Lord in a preaching by Charles Spurgeon. And I've been reading this, and in here he has a wonderful decision, or excuse me, a wonderful statement. He said, if your concept of love does not agree with justice, judgment, purity, and holiness, then your idea of love is wrong. Your idea of love is wrong if it does not agree with justice, judgment, purity, and holiness. So often we think about love in the sense of that it's just you let them get by with the world. But in reality, the love of God, it says if we keep His commandments, we will love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength as the justice of God, as the peace of God, and as the holiness of God. And then reach out to our brothers and love them the same way. Our brothers and sisters in Christ. So not only are we under His commands here as the head of our life, we go on in the Apostle John In verse number 5 says, By this we know that we know Him, but whoever keeps His word, truly the love of God is perfected in Him. We're under His walk. We are under His walk. Verse number 6, it says, He who says He abides in Him ought Himself also to walk just as He walked. He is the example. Jesus Christ is the example. It says we, we should abide in Him. If we say we abide in Him, we ought to walk just as He walked, also to walk. Did you know that you are walking? Well, some of you right now are sitting. But you are walking. Everyone in this room is walking. You are walking a life. Everybody on this earth is walking a life. Whether or not it's a good walk or a bad walk, you are walking a walk. You see, the Bible tells us here, it says, He who says he abides in him ought also himself to walk just as he walked. We should walk following him. We should walk in obedience to him. He's the example and walk just as he walked. Strive to walk like Jesus walked. Knowing we're going to fail, but out of a love relationship for Him, walking just as He walked, loving just as He loved, forgiving just as He forgave, and standing on the Word of God just as He stood on the Word of God. Jesus was loving and forgiving, but also He was not afraid to take some what I call hickories, twist them up, lay it to some Pharisees hide in the temple. Walk as Jesus walked. But you see also, not only in that, but also Christ. Christ, He is not only the example, but the the sustainer. You see, here's the big question. It says, He who says He abides in Him ought Himself also to walk just as He walked. The big question. The big question that you always hear. Are we under law or are we under grace? We under law or we under grace? And then you hear it. Well, I'm not under law, I'm under the grace. Careful. Careful. I absolutely agree. As salvation salvation comes from Christ Jesus, we are free from the punishment of the law. Free from the power of the law. But that, that does not mean that we are completely detached from the law. Jesus came not to abolish and do away, but to fulfill. You see, the Bible says we are to walk as He Himself walked. The only way we can do that is if we allow Him to walk His life through us. 
And when he does that, he will walk his life through us. So when we ask the question, are you under law or under grace? Actually, the answer is we're under the law of grace. We are under the law of grace. When we look at the Old Testament and we say, oh man, I'm glad I don't even have to deal with that anymore. We just took the entire first part of the Bible, cut it off, and threw it into the mud. There's been pastors who have tried to say that. We need to unhinge and detach from the Old Testament. Well, how untrue that would be. You see, what we see here is that if we are to walk as He Himself walked, that means we are walking in accordance with the Old Testament and the New. So we are, in the sense when we say, oh, we're not under law, we're under grace. Yes, we are not under the power and penalty of the law. But my friends, that does not mean we are completely stripped away from it. A life of consecration and holiness is a pure thing to strive for. As Christ Himself accomplished, we are to follow in His steps and trust in Him as sustainer to hold us through the walk. Not only is He our example, He is the only way to accomplish it. Trust in Him as sustainer and Lord. He will bring you through it. And I love what it says here, right before that in verse number 5. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. So if we are to trust in his commands and walk in his commands, the love of God is perfected in him. Oswald Chambers doesn't just leave it at that. He actually goes on and gives us the definition of love that he follows. Love is difficult to define. But the working definition I would like to give is this. Love is the sovereign preference of my person for another person. Embracing everyone and everything in that preference. Now we see the word sovereign and it makes us cringe. Don't cringe. Because it's not the sovereign love of God on this one, this one, this one, this one. It's the sovereign love of God on that one, His Son. The love of God has a preference and it is His Son. Everyone that is found in His Son then has preference with God. Then has the love of God. Then has the peace, grace, and mercy of God. It is by His sweet Son and the words of Christ and obedience to Christ in a love relationship for Jesus. You have the love of God. We're under His walk as our Lord and as our Savior. And then we're under His love because we're under His love. Verse number 7 says, Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. It's the message that Jesus preached. The old command in verse number 7, I write no new command to you. This is an old commandment which you have had. One that you heard from Christ Himself. One you had from the beginning of His ministry. The first message we see Jesus preach, if you go into the Gospel of Mark, He goes in and there is a wonderful passage. Jesus came and He said that He preached the Gospel of the Kingdom of God, not the good news of, but the good news from God, and said, repent. The Gospel of the Kingdom of God and repent, for the Kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus came preaching the message of the gospel. What's the gospel? Jesus Christ died for sinners. That is the short, brief, that right there is the gospel in a quick nutshell. To save them from their sin. Jesus Christ died to save sinners from their sin. Gospel. Quick. And we see, he said, this is no new commandment I write to you. Not saying you have to work. Not saying it's anything different. There's no new command here. It is the old command. But what I'm going to do in verse number 8, he says, John says, this is not an old command. This is the old command. This isn't a new one. But a new commandment I write to you. 
This is the same command with a new command wording. He knew how to make Baptists mad. He reworded it. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. This is the new command that is the exact same thing as the old command. It is the sweet grace of God. And what we have is John's explanation of the command in which Christ shared in what I call the command sandwich. You see in verse number 9, he begins the contrasts. Verse number 9 and verse number 11, John sandwiches the command that he is about to share. The love of God as to love our brother and love God with all we have is sandwiched between two contrasts. Verse number 9 says, He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. And then you see verse number 11, But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going. Because the darkness has blinded his eyes. These two are literally the buns or bread of the sandwich. They're outside and the true meat of the sandwich is sandwiched between them in verse number 10. Verse number 10 is the command in which John truly wants his followers and the people he is writing to to understand this is the command of Christ. If He's your Lord, if He's your Savior, He cannot be Savior. He has to be Savior and Lord. If this is your life, verse number 10, He who loves his brother, He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. There is no cause for stumbling in him. You see, it says here, he who loves his brother abides in the light, lives in it. Literally in the place of light. He is that one that has set up shop in the light. He abides in the light. And what that says here is, and you look at it in the sense, and it says, but he who, he who loves his brother, something we must always understand is that God loved you then. God loved you then. And God loves you now. So go and do the same. Go and do the same. When you were lost in your sin, out in the world, bound by the sin of this world, God loved you then. God loved you then. And then now, in His Son... He loves you in His Son and has saved you from your sin. And now we see that you are abiding in the light. There's no cause for stumbling in Him. Go and love your brother. How wonderful it is to know that John gives the command. He says the same thing as this morning. Go encourage someone. Go love them. Love your brother. Love your brother. As a young Fruitland student, I had the opportunity to go and preach at many different places. I was like, sign me up. I'll go wherever you wanted me to go. It didn't matter. And back then, my preaching was a lot better than it is now. Okay, wow. Wake up. <laughs> I mean, it, you, you get, you, anytime someone says, I need someone to preach, and you're like, I'll go, I'll go, right here, right here, right here, sign me up. And I remember going to this small little church, actually the exact same building, literally, to a T as this one. I'm walking inside, and there were 15 people in this church. At all times, Sunday morning, that was the only ones there. And that was whopping Sunday. I remember preaching to five people. And there was one Sunday morning when I was sitting there preaching and we were talking about the love of God and love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And I had a person 
walk up to me and said, you don't know who I am. I don't care who you are. You can kiss my blank, and I'm not going to love that person. They refuse to forgive someone for something stupid. And they wouldn't reach out and love them. That person sat on the other side of the church. They sat here and the other person sat on the other side of the church. And they refused to. Over a long history. And some once took me aside and tried to explain. I said, please, I don't care. I'm not in it. I'm out of here anyway. I'm only preaching for a little bit. And I'm gone. And he refused to reach out across the aisle and love the person on the other side. Which gives us the complete, full picture of verse number 11. He who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and has no idea where he's going. Why? Because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So much hate, so much anger, so much madness and immaturity. Love your brother, love your sister as yourself. We are never free from walking under the commands of Jesus because He holds us to the utmost. And the thing that is more difficult than anything in the world. Love God and love your brother. I can work with people, be with people, but it's sometimes hard to love people. Love them. The life that Jesus lived is the sufficient life. He is the answer to all problems, the example to all walks, the sacrifice for all mankind, the king of all creation, the teacher of all that is good, the author of all that is lovely, the perfecter of all that is blemished, the cleaner of all that is stained, and the head of all of his children. Jesus is the life. So in the long, drawn-out debate that you hear at the Fruitland students who know it all and the professors that know it all, and they say this and this and this and that and back and forth, let the Word of God do the talking. Are we free from the law? Free from its punishment but not disconnected from it. Can we live life as we simply please? Not if Jesus is your Lord. And what is it that a Christian is commanded to do? Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. Tonight as we close, if there be... Someone on your mind. Now, I have seen Herb Revis preach this one before, and he gets a little more fired up than I do on this one. He lets her rip. And you just won't let it go? You just holding that grudge? Let it go. Just let it go. Go love them. Because trust me, The sin between you and God is a lot worse than the sin between you and them. Sin does go lateral, but sin is majorly vertical. And God loved you and His Son by the sweet grace of Jesus Christ to forgive you of all the debt you paid, of all the sin you had in your life. He forgave you. Let it go. Let it go. I'm still working on some myself, I promise. I'm not above my preaching. But be like Anna and let it go. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, 
God, you've saved us from so much. A burden we could not pay and a burden we could never even fathom the depth of it. And you forgave us of it in your Son. When you look at these old sinners sitting here, Lord God, you have to look through crimson stained glasses. Through blood stained, God, you see us. And we're so thankful for that. God, thank you for your son who came into this world and didn't hold us up to legalism, but held us up to love. He came out of heaven's glory to love us. Jesus, we can never pay you enough. We can never return the favor. All we can simply say is thank you. We praise you for it and we love you. Jesus, thank you for being the Lord of our life. Thank you for giving us a new walk and a new life and holding us to it, being the sustainer of our walk, being the head of this church, being the head of your church. God, we praise you and love you. And you're so precious and wonderful. And it's in Christ's wonderful name we pray. Amen. Everybody have an absolutely blessed and wonderful, wonderful week. I hope to see you back Wednesday night, Wednesday school. We'll be back in. Hope everybody can come back and join us. Uh, Once again, if you can't make it, there'll be a link to go on to Facebook. Oh, thank you, baby. There'll be a link for our um, Google Meet. If you'd like to come and you're unable to make it, we hope you can. Have a blessed evening. We love you and praise you. Praise you. Goodness gracious. I love you and have a wonderful evening.